One of the classic examples of ionic bonding is good old table salt. We owe parts of the English language to the word salt. For instance, the word salary. It comes from the idea that in the old days, Roman soldiers were paid with salt. Or lettuce greens sprinkled with salt were called a salad. Or if you threw sodium chloride on me, that would be called a salt. Let's take a look at the nature of that bond. And the classic example, sodium chloride. So I'll identify where those two are in our periodic table. Let's start by looking at the electron configuration of sodium. So it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. Now that one electron that sodium has in its outermost energy level is very weakly held. Sodium has a low ionization energy and that electron can be easily removed, leaving sodium then with a plus one charge. And that is one of the characteristics of ionic bonds. Metallic elements tend to lose electrons and develop a positive charge, and they're called cations. You can remember this from the T, and cations looks an awful lot like a positive sign. Now, where does that electron end up going? Let's take a look now over here at chlorine. Now, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. It has what we call seven valence electrons. It's highly unlikely it's going to lose electrons. The reason for that is it's a very small atom compared with others in its row, and it holds on very tightly to these outermost electrons, having a very high ionization energy in comparison with sodium. It's far more likely to gain an electron. So that electron is going to make its way over here, changing this P5 to P6, and then it will have the electron configuration of argon, a more stable atom. That process of gaining electrons develops a negative charge. So non-metallic elements tend to gain electrons and form anions. In the final step, opposite charges attract. So in this case, the negatively charged chlorine would now be attracted to the positively charged sodium and hence form the ionic bond. Sodium, and in fact other elements in its column, all tend to do the same thing. They all tend to finish S1 and tend to lose electrons. Hence, they all tend to develop a 1 plus charge. In the next column over, magnesium and calcium on down, all tend to finish S2 and will tend to lose those electrons. If we move across the transition metals for a minute, we'll come back to them later. Everything in this family, aluminum, gallium, and indium, and so forth, these all tend to lose three electrons to form stable configurations. Starting at the other end now, where our chlorine was, the species all tend to gain one electron to become stable. The next column over tend to gain two, and nitrogen and its family tend to gain three. So these tend to be the typical charges developed by our species. Now what about these elements in the middle, the transition metals? Well, as mentioned, metals tend to lose electrons. What's different about these particular elements is they can tend to lose more than just one particular number of elements. Let's look briefly at iron for a moment. Now, iron's configuration, I'll use the brief method here. I'll start at the element argon, and then we go to 4s2, and then we start to fill up the 3d, 
and it would be 3d6. Iron in this particular case, the most weakly held electrons are those that are way out here in the 4s. Those would tend to leave and when they do, iron is left with a 2 plus charge. In fact, all of these elements have this particular idea in hand. They all have 4s electrons with some 3d electrons and they will all tend to lose the 4s. Hence you notice that all of the elements here in the transition metals tend to develop a 2 plus charge. But they can also develop other charges. For instance, iron. If it was to lose one more electron from here, it would then be down to 5 and have a half-filled orbital, which is also more stable, now raising its charge to 3 plus. Other elements can also do similar things, but all I want you to notice here really is that the elements that tend to be in the center region, the transition metals, tend to have a multitude of possible charges. Let's take that now and look at how we name some of these compounds. Our general rule is we name the cation first, followed by the anion finishing an IDE. So for instance, the first example I'll go through here, K is potassium. Combined here with iodine, so that would become iodide to finish with the IDE. My next one would be copper. Combining with oxygen, and you would call it copper oxide. However, we need to give a little bit more information here. Copper, as we note, is down here in our transition metals, and it possesses more than one charge. We need to specify what charge it's using in this compound. If we go back here, oxygen we know is two negative. The fact that there's one copper there accompanying it to neutralize it must mean the copper then is possessing a two plus charge. So this would be copper two oxide. Next one down, we have magnesium. Combining with bromine, so it would become bromide. Let's see if we can go the other way now. Come up with the formula given the name. Lithium, there in the table, tends to have that particular charge, the ability to lose one electron. And sulfide, on the other hand, wants to gain two electrons. So in order for this to happen, in order to balance this, in order for the sulfur to gain two, I require two lithiums in order for that to occur. So the formula here would be Li2 and S for the sulfur. Here, iron two nitride. Uh, nitrogen is uh, N and it's got a three minus. Iron is again multivalent, has many possible charges, but we're being specified here to use the two, so it would be two plus. So iron wants to lose two electrons and nitrogen gain three. We need to balance that. So we can do that by having three irons, which would then lose six, and two nitrogens that would then gain those six. So our formula then would be Fe3 and two. Now, not only can atoms gain or lose electrons, but groups of atoms can gain or lose electrons. These are what we call polyatomic ions groups of elements that can gain or lose electrons. And you have here a list of the most common ones that you will need to connect to memory. Let's use a couple of those and see if we can do some naming. So here I see that first group present up here. So this chemical would be called ammonium. And the NO3 here nitrate. The next one, Mn is manganese. Now 
Now, it is also located in the multivalent region. We'll figure it out in a moment. And it's attached to the polyatomic ion hydroxide. Now, going back here to the formula, hydroxide from my table tends to be 1 minus. Now, I have four of them present. So that means they need to gain four electrons. That would then happen only if my manganese happened to lose four electrons. So it must have a four plus charge in this compound. So the Roman numeral for that is IB. And let's see if we can go the other way. Sodium with carbonate. Sodium is plus one and carbonate from my list up here is two minus. So carbonates want to gain two electrons. That means I require two sodiums to lose those two electrons. So the formula then would be Na2 and the carbonate CO3. And lastly, my copper two sulfate. Um, sulfate tends to be two minus, wanting to gain two electrons. And copper here is using the two charge, so that will be two plus. And that's a perfect match. Um, so this then would be CuSO4. So that's a quick review of the nature of the ionic bond, as well as how to name ionic compounds.